like it. Um, so everybody, good morning. Please rise as you are able to sing uh, the presence of our God. It's here. families, which we've been examining a lot, and Phil's going to be talking about sacred relationships and the relationships that make up our families, and whether those be people you are blood related to or not, uh, families are found in all kinds of places, which we know because we all find family here every week that you decide to come, maybe not every single week, that's fine, um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, okay, we're going to keep singing, Love and Justice is our next song. Welcome to worship today, where we celebrate how we find God in community. And I especially want to welcome those of you who are visiting with us. There's a lot of things you could be doing at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and we're so glad that you decided to join us here. And also a special welcome to those of us who are joining us via webcast. Now I'm going to pass these friendship baskets around, and within these baskets there's name tags, offering envelopes, as well as these ivory information and joy and concern cards where on one side if we don't have your information maybe you're new joining us or you just had a change in some of your information we'd love to have that so we can contact you during the week on the other side there's a special space for any joys or concerns that are on your heart as staff we value the voices of our community and the joys and concerns that you share with us. We'll pray with you during the week on those. And speaking of those joys and concerns, I want to open our space now for prayers. 
Our theme today is sacred relationships, and I think so much of the substance of our prayers is what's going on in those relationships that we have that make up our lives, that we value, and that also may give us pain. And I just want to create space now for us to lift up the names of those who we love and those who we hope God will hold in God's love and light. God, in all of these names and all of those we love, spoken and those held in the deepest parts of our heart, we just ask you to hold them in your love and your light, that we may continue to see your love reflected in their eyes. Amen. Now I invite you in the spirit of community to pass the peace of Christ with one another. here on the rug for just a little minute? That'd be great. I'm going to invite my friend Shoyinka, who I invited to church today, and her friend Samira, who's visiting with us today. That's Samira right there. (laughs) So I'm just wondering if you know, I'm just wondering if you, I'm just wondering if you know that you are the most amazing thing that God has ever created. That means you are, and you are, and you are, and you, 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 and all the people who are on the webcast, too, and pretty much everyone else. We are the most wonderful thing, and me, too. That's the best part. I am the most wonderful thing that God ever created. So here's what I think. I think if we are all the most wonderful things that God created, we should treat each other that way. Oh, gosh. That's such a big responsibility, though, because sometimes it's hard, you know, to treat someone else like they are a special thing made by God. That we have to remember that we can come with love and we can come with kindness and we can stand up for each other and we can tell each other the truth and we can forgive each other when someone tells us the truth that we don't necessarily want to hear, and that when we get angry, we can make up, and that maybe we don't have to have a fight, that maybe we can work out things in other ways. These are all ways that I think that we probably need to treat each other because we are the most amazing things that God ever created. So every relationship is a sacred relationship. It's kind of a God relationship. One of the reasons I invited Shoinka this morning is just this very week, as I've been kind of thinking about the sermon, I heard her sing just a little bit of a song that she made up. Shoinka is great at both playing her flute and making up songs. And she sang this um, in a a meeting that we were in, and I just thought, oh, 
this is perfect for church. <laughs> and so I recorded it on my iPhone so I could bring it and I could play it on my iPhone. And then I thought, well, what would be better than to actually have her come in person and do it? And I'm so glad she could come and I'm so glad that Samira could come with her. So can you just sing? It's just a little tiny phrase, but I think it kind of says it all. Can you just sing it? Yeah. Love me so much, I'll never hold back. I love you so much, I'll never hold back. Love you so much, I'll never hold back. Love me so much, you'll never hold back. <laughs> and do you, do you hear that part where she's saying, you know, I'm not going to hold back from loving you, and I hope you won't hold back from loving me, which is which is a powerful thing, isn't it? Can you sing it with yeah, me? Yeah, can you sing it again? Sing it one more time, and then we'll sing it together. Okay. Here goes. I love you so much, I'll never hold back. Love me so much, you'll never hold back. I love you so much, I'll never hold back. Love me so much, you'll never hold back. I love you so much, I'll never hold back. Shoinka's practices, when she greets someone, that rather than saying hello or how are you or whatever, she says, Peace and many blessings. She says that to you every time you see her. It's so nice to hear that. So could we just turn to someone at, next to us and just say, Peace and many blessings to you. <laughs> thank you all so much, and thank you, Shoinka, for being here. And for my- So this does seem to be to be one of the biggest challenges of the gospel that, you know, Jesus says, love your enemies. Um, and I figure that the way that Jesus talked about our relationships, he was pretty much talking about everyone, the way that we need to relate to everyone, that we don't just love the people who are in our tribe, in our group, but we look beyond those boundaries and that we really need to exercise that same sort of care and concern for other people. If each one of us is amazingly created in God, and we get to include ourselves in that, hear that message, that you are a special person created in God who deserves to be treated in a sacred way, but that we need to practice that same thing with almost everyone that we can come in contact with or see or think of or even imagine. That is a huge task. And so we start close in. That seems like a a, a logical place to start because actually sometimes it's the close in relationships that can be the hardest. But those are the places where it's hardest to practice that recognition that I am in relationship with someone who is awesomely created by God. That when we're behaving like the human beings that we are, which is not always well, (laughs) that that is when it's a challenge for us to see the God in each other. But every relationship, because each of us contains that central place where God lives, each of us is in sacred relationship. Each relationship 
is sacred. Now it seems to me that this call outside ourselves and outside our circles also indicates that we might need to be paying a slightly different attention to our relationships than what's presented in the culture, that in our culture we have all kinds of ideas about the people who are supposed to be the most important to us, the people we're married to, or the people that we live with, or the people that are relatives, or whatever. But actually our gospel and our religious tradition calls us beyond those boundaries, beyond the boundaries of tribe. And so if there is this sacred quality to relationships, it could be that on our lives right now, There are very special people that may be so important to us, and yet the shape of the relationship doesn't always match up the pictures in the culture. So we might have people that we care about deeply, that we're connected to in profound ways, but that may not be primary relationships or whatever that might be. And it seems like one of the gifts that God has given us is this ability to see and recognize the power of these relationships. When you're in community and church, actually you are called into that very direct relationship with people outside your circle. That seems to be one of the powers of this institution, that I get to hang out with people who are beyond my circle. And I am called to be in direct and special relationship with you all. In the Bible, there are a couple of stories that um, are often lifted up as examples of stories that, of relationships that worked in a slightly different way. The first story I'm going to tell you has to do with David and Jonathan. I have read more of the book of Samuel this week than I probably ever have. (laughs) Because the story of David in particular is a very long one in the Bible. But the backstory to this relationship between David and Jonathan was that In the land of Israel, for a long time, uh, decisions seemed to be made or the power seemed to rest in the prophets. And at one point, Samuel, who was one of these primary prophets, discerned or received a message from God that the people were asking for a king. And so the first king was appointed, anointed by, by Samuel, and that was Saul. Jonathan was Saul's son. And I'm not sure whether he would have been kind of in line for power. I'm not sure they had those rules yet. Since it was the first king, they probably hadn't made up the rules yet about succession. But we know we've got those rules down now, don't we? (laughs) Um, But anyway, Jonathan was um, was the son of Saul. And David was a nobody to begin with. He was the son of Jesse. And it came to pass that Saul was not behaving all that well as a king, and Samuel, the prophet, was not all that happy with the way that uh, Saul was behaving. And so God said to him, I'm going to indicate to you who you might move in as you move Saul out. A little shift of power. And so this process went by, and I'm not going to tell you that part of the story. That will be another time when you talk about David. But uh, David, who was the most um, kind of unlikely person, because number one, he was young, He was the youngest of Jesse's sons, and it was kind of like Jesse trotted out all of his sons first. Well, maybe this is the one. Samuel said, no, that's not the one. Brought it out another one. It was kind of like like the the wicked stepsisters in the shoe. You know, oh, no, that's not the right one. No, that's not the right one. Finally, they seemed to be running out of sons, and and Jesse said, well, I have one more son, but he's he's out with the sheep, and he's young. He's kind of the runt of the family. Um, But they brought David in, and Samuel recognized that this is the person who would be the next to have power. And through a long kind of story, David ended up in the court of Saul and ended up being a bit of a, of a, a competitor with Saul. And again, this is a long story, but a lot of back and forth. And actually, Jonathan made a, almost a direct connection with David early on. It was like the first time David was brought to the court, it said that Jonathan um, found, found this deep connection with him, and he he gave David several signs of that, that sense of connection. And over time, as there was this kind of struggle for power, Jonathan was the one who was often feeding David information, sometimes at the risk of his own life, of Jonathan's own life. But they were deeply committed. At one point, Jonathan says, If I make it through this alive, continue to be my covenant friend. If I die, keep the covenant friendship with my family forever. 
And when God finally rids the earth of David's enemies, stay loyal to Jonathan. Jonathan repeated his pledge of love and friendship for David. He loved David more than his own soul. And a little bit later, there's a period where Jonathan is trying to get David a message about whether it's safe for him to come to the to the court of to Saul's court. And so David's hiding in a field, and Jonathan comes out to him, and it turns out actually it's a dangerous time. So David got up from his hiding place beside the boulder, then fell on his face to the ground three times, prostrating himself. And then they kissed one another and wept, friend over friend. David weeping especially hard. Jonathan said, go in peace. The two of us have vowed friendship in God's name, saying, God will be the bond between me and you, between between my children and your children. So here was this friendship, this connection between these two men that seemed unlikely. They could have been competitors for the throne. And yet Jonathan saw something in David, and they saw something in each other, and that was what saved David's life. And then another story from the book of Ruth. There was um, a, a woman named uh, Naomi, and she was married to a man. They lived in, uh, in Judah, and there was a famine in the land, and so they decided to move to the country of Moab. And so essentially they were moving from where their people lived to the place of another tribe, another people. Uh, and so they moved, and it came to pass two, two things. One was that um, her husband died. And the other thing was that her sons uh, took Moab women as wives. So they started to make this connection, direct connection with the Moabite people. But then the sons both died. And so there was uh, Naomi and, um, and her two um, daughters-in-law, who were Orpah and Ruth, and, uh, and you know, of course, in this culture, women without men to take care of them, to provide for them, that was always a, a challenging situation. Um, and at some point, um, Naomi learned that there was now food in the land of Judah, and so she decided that she needed to move back to where she came from. And actually, her daughters prepared, her daughters-in-law prepared to go with her, and they started out down the road. And this was a, this was a challenging thing for her to make, to make this decision to move back. Uh, and the two daughters went with her, and as they went down the road a little bit, uh, Naomi said, oh, you know, I really can't ask you to do this. I can't ask you to leave your people. I can't guarantee you that you'll find men to marry. I don't, I think you should go back. I think you should go back. And uh, Orpah, the, one of the daughters-in-law, did. She gave Naomi a hug, and she returned to, to the lands of the Moabite people. But Ruth wouldn't part from her, Ruth said, well, she said this, where you go, I go, and where you live, I'll live. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Where you die, I'll die, and that's where I'll be buried. So help me, God, not even death itself is going to come between us. So again, these, the relationships between these two women which crossed over the practices of their people in so many ways, and yet the bond was so powerful and so deep that they made those decisions. Now, I've chosen two stories about relationships between people of the same gender. You can read into that what you will. (laughs) But even though one of the points that I'm not going to dwell on today might be that actually there are people of the same gender who have had to fight to have their sacred relationships be named and claimed. The bigger issue really is that these sacred relationships, these very special relationships that we might have in our lives might be surprising ones. They might not fit in the categories that have been. So look around you, look around you to see who it is that you love and you care for. Look around, who are the people who have led you, who have been with you? Who are the people that would move to another country with you? Who are the people who would come bail you out at 3 o'clock in the morning? Who are the people who would bring you food when you were, when you were suffering? Who are the people who would cry with you, who would laugh with you, who would pray for you? 
It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what those relationships are. Claim them because they are a gift from God. They are sacred relationships. They may be the people that you've lived with or partnered with for years and years, but they may not be. They may be related to you, or they may not be. But you will know in your heart, deep in your heart, who those people are. And for us to be able to, com- to claim those as part of our, our spiritual being, as part of the thing that feeds us, the thing that keeps us going, the things that, that pro- provides us the sense of support that we need in the world, that that can come from so many surprising places. Love me so much, you'll never be loved. I'll love you so much. will not hold back our love. We are called by God as challenging as that is to not hold back our love. And where there is love, there must be justice. There must be equality. There must be fairness. There must be uh, our ability to stand up for each other because sometimes the people that we're loving are they're far away. It's much it's much a bigger question, not just interpersonal, it's a bigger question. And our best way of acting is to bring justice into the world, into those relationships with the people right next to us and the people who are far away. those relationships, we can all reach out and keep each other from feeling alone. Yeah, in the spirit of um, welcome, extravagant welcome. And you can sing along with this one if you know it or if you pick it up. Of course, it's great for singing along.
so as we are thinking about sacred relationships, about love and openness and community, friends, loved ones, we think about Christ. I think about Christ who gave all and held nothing back and gave us an example of how we should love one another, how we should care for one another. In our time of communion, we want to honor that. We want to honor the person sitting next to us. We want to honor the person in front of us and share the love of Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this service. We thank you for the words that we have heard today. We thank you for the call that you placed on us to love one another. Now give us the strength that we need. Give us the vision that we need. Give us the heart that we need in order to love your people. Bless this communion and be with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. On this Memorial Day, it makes sense to me that we might also lift up the people who have served our country in times of war. And if we are going to stand for justice, then we must also call to account the treatment of veterans in this country and the, the lack of care and concern that is often given. So I invite those thoughts and memories into this table uh, this, this weekend. Jesus was with his friends. I don't think he was married to any of them. I don't think he was directly related to any of them. I don't know if Mary was around or not, but he was surrounded by people that were that he was in sacred relationship with. And at the meal, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat this bread, remember me, remember what I've taught you, remember what we've done together, remember our vision for the world. Remember. And in a similar way, he took the cup and he poured it out. And he lifted up to his friends and his family. And he said, this is my, my spirit, my lifeblood poured out for you. Every time you drink this cup, remember me. Remember what I've taught you. Remember what we've done together. Remember our vision for the world. Remember. This meal is open to anyone. Anyone can come. And it is another sign of how we are in sacred relationship. It's another way for us to recognize in this meal that we are loved profoundly by God. And we are loved in this community and beyond. I'd like to invite four people who might want to help us serve communion this morning to come and join us at the table.
pray with me, please? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. Fill my mind with your peace, my heart with your love, my body with your light. Amen. Now invite us to share our offering. So many of the gifts that we have, the substance that we possess, is ours for a little bit, but it's not our own. All good things that come through us, they, they course through us so that we can receive them and give them back out again. I invite you to share generously so that your gifts may be a blessing to others. I also want to share some announcements today. Uh, the PSR graduation will be taking place in our sanctuary at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And the church office will also be closed for Memorial Day on Monday, May 26th, while we take a moment to honor and remember those who have served, who have given their lives, and whose lives have been irrevocably changed. We'll take a moment and hold them in our hearts, too. I also want to invite you to some fabulous music events we've got going on here. First of all, if you liked what you heard here with Mindy and Eric Hartroot, they're going to be performing their CD release concert on Thursday, May 29th at 7.30 in Loper. Are you doing Doors at 7? Doors at 7. Doors at 7. Music starts at 7.30. So get there early because I think this is going to fill up. Free. And it's free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also having the Prairie Church Companion Pick a Party Saturday, May 31st at 7 o'clock in the Large Assembly. And it's brought to you by Greg Beatty, Vicki Krebin, and Jim Maroney. Tickets are at the door for $25. Next Sunday, June 1st, is our seventh Sunday of Easter, and our Modern Family Series concludes with a focus on families, tied and untied. Phil Porter will be preaching again at 9 a.m. At 10 o'clock, we'll have a transition strategy <coughs> meeting, meeting in the large assembly as we look towards our senior minister transition. And then at 11 o'clock, Patricia DeYoung, our senior minister, will be preaching. Now I also want to take a moment to hold in our hearts those in our community who we want to hold in God's light. We offer prayers for Lorana McVeigh as she recovers from surgery. And we hold continued prayers for John Wadman.
you go out into the world knowing that you are loved so deeply by God and that that sacred center that is within you can connect with others who also have that same sacred center that we can live in peace and that we can bring justice to the world. Amen.